Chapter 17 Althor Alone While the Bogar and the canoes were winding their long and complicated way through the marshes, Althor was following the route his old boat Molly used to take back to the castle. Althor was flying the way he loved to fly, low and very fast, and it was not long before he overtook the bullet boat. It was a sorry sight. Ten oarsmen were wearily pulling on the oars as the boat crept slowly back up the river. Sitting in the stern of the boat was the hunter, hunched, shivering, and silently pondering his fate, while in the prow the apprentice, to the hunter's extreme irritation, fidgeted about, occasionally kicking the side of the boat out of boredom, and in an effort to get some feeling back into his toes. Althor flew unseen over the boat, for he appeared only to those he chose, and continued his journey. Above him the clear sky was clouding over with heavy snow clouds, and the moon had disappeared, plunging the bright snow-covered river banks into darkness. As Althor drew nearer to the castle, fat snowflakes began to drift lazily down from the sky, and as he approached the final bend in the river that would take him around Raven's Rock, the air became suddenly thick with snow. Althor slowed right down, for even a ghost can find it hard to see where he's going in a blizzard, and carefully flew on toward the castle. Soon, through the white wall of snow, Althor could see the glowing red embers that were all that remained of Sally Mullen's tea and alehouse. The snow sizzled and spat as he landed on the charred pontoon, and as Althor lingered for a moment over the remains of Sally's pride and joy, he hoped that somewhere on the cold river the hunter was enjoying the blizzard. Althor flew up the rubbish dump, past the discarded rat door, and made a steep ascent over the castle wall. He was surprised how peaceful and quiet the castle was. He had somehow expected the upheavals of the evening to show, but it was past midnight by now, and a fresh blanket of snow covered the deserted courtyards and old stone buildings. Althor skirted around the palace and headed along the broad avenue known as Wizard Way that led to the Wizard Tower. He began to feel nervous. What would he find? Drifting up the outside of the tower, he soon spotted the small arched window at the top that he had been looking for. He melted himself through the window and found himself standing outside Marsh's front door, or so it had been a few hours earlier. Althor did the ghost equivalent of taking a deep breath and composed himself. Then he carefully discomposed himself just enough to pass through the solid purple planks and thick silver hinges of the door and expertly rearranged himself on the other side. Perfect. He was back in Marsh's rooms. And so was the dark wizard, the necromancer, Dom Daniel. Dom Daniel was asleep on Marsh's sofa. He lay on his back with his black robes wrapped around him and his short, black, cylindrical hat pulled down over his eyes while his head rested on Boy 412's pillows. Dom Daniel's mouth was wide open and he was snoring loudly. It was not a pretty sight. Althor stared at Dom Daniel, finding it strange to see his old master again in the very same place where they had spent so many years together. Althor did not remember those years with any fondness, even though he had learned all and much more than he had wanted to know about magic. Dom Daniel had been an arrogant and unpleasant extraordinary wizard, completely uninterested in the castle and the people there who needed his help, pursuing only his desire for extreme power and eternal youth or rather, since Dom Daniel had taken a while to work it out, eternal middle age. The Dom Daniel who lay snoring in front of Althor looked at first glance much the same as he had remembered him from all those years ago, but as Althor scrutinized him more closely, he saw that all was not unchanged. There was a gray tinge to the necromancer's skin that spoke of years spent underground in the company of shades and shadows, an aura of the other side still clung to him and filled the room with the smell of overripe mold and damp earth. As Althor watched, a thin line of dribble slowly made its way out of the corner of Don Dano's mouth and wandered down his chin, where it dripped onto his black cloak. To the accompaniment of Don Dano's snores, Althor surveyed the room. It looked remarkably unchanged, as though Marcia was likely to walk in at any moment, sit down and tell him about her day, as she always did. But then Althor noticed the large scorch mark where the thunder flash had struck down the assassin. A charred black assassin-shaped hole was burned into Marsha's treasured silk carpet. So it really had happened, thought Althor. The ghost wafted over to the hatch on the rubbish chute, which was still gaping open, and peered into the chill blackness. He shivered and reflected on the terrifying journey they all must have had. And then, because Althor wanted to do something, however small it might be, 
He stepped over the boundary between the ghostly and the living world. He caused something to happen. He slammed the hatch closed. Bang! Dom Dana woke up with a start. He sat bolt upright and stared around him, momentarily wondering where he was. Soon, with a little sigh of satisfaction, he remembered. He was back where he belonged, back in the rooms of the extraordinary wizard, back at the top of the tower, back with a vengeance. Dom Dana looked about him, expecting to see his apprentice, who should have returned hours ago with the news at last of the end of the princess and that awful woman, Marcia Overstrand, not to mention a couple of the heaps thrown into the bargain. The fewer of them remaining, the better, thought Dom Daniel. He shivered in the chill air of the night, and clicked his fingers impatiently to rekindle the fire in the gate. It flared up, and poof! Arthur blew it out. Then he wafted the smoke out from the chimney, and set Dom Daniel coughing. The old necromancer may be here, thought Arthur grimly, and there may be nothing I can do about that, but he's not going to enjoy it, not if I can help it. It was well into the early hours of the morning, after Dom Daniel had gone upstairs to bed and had had considerable trouble sleeping due to the fact that the sheet seemed to be intent on strangling him, when the apprentice returned. The boy was white with tiredness and cold. His green robes were caked in snow, and he trembled as the guardsman who had escorted him to the door made a quick exit and left him alone to face his master. Dom Daniel was in a foul temper as the door let the apprentice in. "'I hope!' Dom Daniel told the trembling boy, that you have some interesting news for me. Arthur hovered around the boy, who was almost unable to speak from exhaustion. He felt sorry for the boy. It was not his fault that he was apprenticed to Dom Daniel. Arthur blew on the fire and got it going again. The boy saw the flames jump in the grate and mo made to move over to the warmth. Where are you going? thundered Dom Daniel. I, I'm cold, sir. You're not going near that fire until you tell me what happened. Are they dispatched? The boy looked puzzled. I, I told him it was a projection, he mumbled. What are you on about, boy? What was a projection? Their boat. Well, you managed that, I suppose. Simple enough. But are they dispatched? Dead? Yes or no? Dom Daniel's voice rose in exasperation. He had already guessed the answer, but he had to hear it. No, whispered the boy, looking terrified his sodden robes dripping on the floor as the snow began to melt in the faint heat that Arthur's fire was giving off. Dom Daniel cast a withering look toward the boy. You are nothing but a disappointment. I go to endless trouble to rescue you from a disgrace of a family. I give you an education most boys can only dream of. And what do you do? Act like a complete fool. I just do not understand it. A boy like you should have found that rabble in no time, and all you do is come back with some story about projections and, and drip all over the floor. Dom Daniel decided that if he was awake, he didn't see why the Supreme Custodian should not be awake too, and as for the hunter, he'd be very interested in what he had to say for himself. Dom Daniel strode out, slamming the door behind him, and set off down the static silver stairs, clattering past endless dark floors left empty and echoing by the exodus of all the ordinary wizards earlier that evening. The wizard tower was chill and gloomy with the absence of magic. A cold wind moaned as it was drawn up as though through a huge chimney, and doors banged mournfully in the empty rooms. As Dom Daniel descended, becoming quite dizzy from the never-ending spirals of the stairs, he noted all the changes with approval. This was how the tower was going to be from now on, a place for serious dark magic. None of those irritating, ordinary wizards prancing around with their pathetic little spells. No more namby-pamby incense and plinky-plonky happy sounds floating in the air, and certainly no more frivolous colors and lights. His magic would be used for greater things, except he might fix the stairs. Dom Daniel eventually emerged into the dark and silent hall. The silver doors to the tower hung forlornly open. Snow had blown in and covered the motionless floor, which was now a dull gray stone. He swept through the doors and strode across the courtyard. As Dom Daniel stamped angrily through the snow, and made his way along Wizard Way to the palace, he began to wish he had thought to change out of his sleeping robes and slippers before he had stormed out. He arrived at the palace gate, a somewhat soggy and unprepossessing figure, and the lone palace guard refused to let him in. Dom Daniel struck the guard down with a thunderflash and strode in. 
Very soon the Supreme Custodian was roused from his bed for the second night running. Back at the tower, the apprentice had stumbled to the sofa and fallen into a cold and unhappy sleep. Alther took pity on him and kept the fire going. While the boy slept, the ghost also took the opportunity of causing a few more changes. He loosened the heavy canopy above the bed so that it was hanging only by a thread. He took the wicks out of all the candles. He added a murky green color to the water tanks and installed a large, aggressive family of cockroaches in the kitchen. He put an irritable rat under the floorboards and loosened all the joints of the most comfortable chairs. And then, as an afterthought, he exchanged Dom Daniel's stiff black cylindrical hat, which lay abandoned on the bed, for one just a little bigger. As dawn broke, Alther left the apprentice sleeping and made his way out to the forest, where he followed the path he had once taken with Silas on a visit to Sarah and Galen many years ago.